Hello, everyone. We will start. Um, I have been asked to, uh, to introduce uh, Sergi, uh, so I will do so, and then uh, Sergi will, uh, will start. Um, I don't know, uh, I guess the first thing is that uh, Sergi doesn't have a, a, a traditional academic career like uh, uh, many of the people in our department, so I think it's interesting to, to understand a little bit that. Uh, he finished uh, a degree in physics uh, at the Universidad of Barcelona in uh, 1986, so that's quite uh, a long time ago. He looks young, but in fact he's not that much younger than, than I am. <laughs> um, then in the 90s, uh, he was uh, very active in uh, developing and conceiving a number of uh, interactive installations and multimedia performances in collaboration with uh, quite well-known Catalan artists uh, like uh, Marcelí Antúnez and, uh, and La Fuerza dels Baus. And, and those at that time, maybe uh, many of you were not around at that time, but they had quite a bit of impact and, uh, and recognition in, uh, in uh, artistic circles, technology circles, of the, 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 the innovation that uh, that had. Uh, then in the 90s, uh, uh, in the middle 90s, he joined uh, which uh, what is now the that the audiovisual institute of uh, our university so the upf uh, at the very beginning of the university uh, created uh, the audiovisual institute to promote uh, technology related to audiovisual media and uh, that's uh, where uh, i also joined the university and where uh, sergi uh, joined uh, the university uh, uh, with and, uh, and through the Audiovisual Institute, that's how we started the music technology group. And, and in fact, that's how the, the department, uh, our department was, uh, was born. So the te at that time, we call it uh, technology department. It was born through the Audiovisual Institute. So in fact, Sergi uh, taught in, in, uh, in, uh, in our department from day one. Uh, so he's one of the very early uh, faculty members of, uh, of our department. Um, uh, but at that time, he didn't have a PhD, even though he had been doing some PhD activities in, in Madrid. So he actually joined the, the PhD program, the first uh, PhD uh, year that we had, that we offered the PhD in our department. I think it was 1999, 2000. And uh, he finished the, the PhD in, uh, I think, uh, 2005. So he, he's uh, one of the, the first uh, people that got the PhD in our department. Um, I guess talking uh, about Sergi, uh, you have to talk about the React Table. Uh, he's, uh, I guess you all know, he's uh, best known for uh, the, as being the main inventor of uh, the React Table. Uh, I assume you all have uh, heard about it and uh, you might have uh, seen it in the basement of, the, of uh, our building, of the Tanger building. And of course, out of that, uh, he has received uh, many awards and uh, many, uh, a lot of recognition. And he got uh, a Ciutat de Barcelona award uh, in the multimedia category in 2007. He got an Ars Electronica Golden Nika in 2008. And I would say basically in the last, uh, more than last 10 years, uh, a lot of his activity and, uh, uh, has been around that. Uh, so that's good, and at the same time, it might cause some problems because basically, you, he has been looked as the React Table guy, and he has been very much asked internationally for that, and he has been very active in uh, promoting and doing a lot of research and development, and also in the industrial and tech transfer type of activities around that uh, that instrument. Uh, he's now an associate professor, so Professor Agregat in our department, um, and he heads uh, one of the labs of the, the Music Technology Group, the Music and multi uh, Multimodal Interaction Lab. And his research uh, activities and interest within uh, that now it basically is at the confluence of uh, human-computer interaction, of tangible and uh, physiological interaction, sound and music computing, and also computational creativity, which is uh, kind of the name that uh, he gave to, to this talk. And in the past few years, uh, he has been heading uh, especially two large EU projects, uh, Giant Steps and Rapid Mix, which I guess uh, he will be talking about, in which uh, he, um, him and, uh, and his uh, team has, uh, have been working 
on uh, areas uh, that uh, basically are at the confluence of music information retrieval and uh, creativity and how to use uh, these uh, new uh, uh, technologies related with information retrieval for uh, creativity and uh, music creation in particular. So I really don't know what he's going to talk about. I guess, uh, 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 again, uh, the, the React table uh, issue might be uh, 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 something that he might or not try to avoid. That's, uh, <laughs> so, but uh, for sure, he's a, a great communicator, and uh, he normally gives a great talk. So I am looking forward to his presentation. So thank you very much. And uh, Sergi, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thanks, Xavier, for this very long and very well-informed introduction. As I will explain uh, at some point, uh, I mean, yeah, we know each other from a long time. Um, so as Xavier said, I am the head of the Music and Multimodal Interaction Lab at the MTG. Uh, he already mentioned our main focus, as are also specified here in my Google Scholar page could be at the confluence of computational creativity, sound and music computing, and human-computer interaction. Um, so today, I'm not going to talk about the React table. Um, I, I will divide this talk in four parts. Uh, first, I will introduce the topic of computational creativity. Uh, I will give some personal motivations, because as Xavier has said, uh, I guess my, my academic story and research story is a bit strange or, or not so common. I will talk about uh, in very briefly about what we have done in, in the music and, and in the MMI lab uh, for what I say for the last two decades, considering like three ages or three generations of, of people who have worked uh, together. And finally, I will conclude the last part with a study more in depth about one of the last uh, projects we have done. So. Uh, to start, is, what is computational creativity? Here's a definition uh, according to the Association for Computational Creativity. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary endeavor that is located at the intersection of the fields of artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, philosophy, and the arts. And its goal is to model, simulate, or replicate creativity using a computer. This obviously leads us to some very commonplace questions such as can computers be creative? Can computers make art? I really find these questions very rhetorical and I'm not at all interested in them. I will not discuss about these things. Uh, only the thing I want to, to add is that I'm more concerned or I, I'm really for the last goal of these three bullet lists uh, given by the association, uh, which is using computers for enhancing human creativity. So if, if we go back uh, in, in time, in any case, the idea of using computers for making or replicating creative tasks or outcomes is as, almost as old as computing. Here we have two Mondrians, one made, made by him and one made by IBM. Uh, which we, one is the, the, the good one? Raise your hand. I think the majority has lost. Okay, uh, so you voted for the IBM Mondrian, who was done in 1966. Uh, what? Where are we today in, in the generation of, of images and, and kind of visual arts uh, uh, related to computational creativity? Well, a couple of years ago, uh, Google opened the Magenta project uh, on top of TensorFlow for studying creativity in music and in visual arts. So obviously, that has bought a lot of buzz to, to, to this topic currently. Uh, in my opinion, Magenta's uh, outcomes can go from the rather kind of kitsch and, and maybe obvious, like this Van Gogh guy's uh, effect, uh, to some really intriguing and, and interesting stuff. I mean, I find these images uh, like kind of a Francis Bacon uh, nightmare thing really intriguing. Those have been done by, uh, with Magenta. On the music side, algorithmic music or music done with algorithms is quite old, centuries, and specifically music done with computers is also as old as computing. There's a first composition in 1956. Uh, and if we talk about imitating styles, I mean, well, from 
this point, I mean, there were different trends. Some were imitative and some not so much. Uh, if we talk about imitating styles, there's hard to surpass, for example, the word of David Koch from the late 90s. We will listen to 30 seconds and tell me what you've heard. Well, there's not time to ask anyone, but probably many of you have uh, discovered Debussy. That's a new Debussy prelude made by uh, David Cope's software. Um, another branch, and which is the one I'm more interested, is related to interactive music, which means putting really the human in the loop. This is a very beautiful, I, I, a quote I like from uh, the, the great uh, 20th century composer, Yanis Senakis, uh, where he says, the composer becomes, in this type of systems, this quote is from 71, which is really the start of this tendency, obviously because before computers were not fast enough for real time computations. Uh, I mean, they, they could make sounds, they could compose, but not in real time. I, I, at the early 70s, uh, these things start to, to become possible. And Yanis Shinaki says, the composer becomes a sort of pilot, presses buttons, and supervises the control of a cosmic vessel uh, in the space of sound. I, I, I really like this metaphor, and I, I tend to use a quite similar one or related one. I, I say if playing an acoustic instrument is like riding a bicycle, playing an electrical instrument would be like riding a motorcycle, playing an interactive uh, system instrument would be like uh, riding or, or uh, driving a jet in semi-automatic mode. Uh, is one better than the other? Obviously, that's not the question. They are all different and they are meant for different things. So no one would compare a jet with a bicycle. Okay? Um, if we talk about technologies, that uh, there are many technique or techniques that have been used since the beginning, from the traditional Markov models, which I will uh, recover in my talk, uh, to today's uh, neural networks and machine learning, passing by chaos theory, uh, genetic algorithms, gen uh, generative grammar. So many uh, tools have been used for these purposes. Uh, you would think maybe that that's kind of a, a, a problem for freaky and arty nerds that's talking about computers making music, but let's see a real and recent example of something quite related. Um, some months ago, it was discovered that Spotify was, I mean, was accused of employing ghost composers, which were obviously real humans, for uh, producing music of which Spotify would own the rights. This type of music, uh, uh, felt kind of in, in the easy listening side, you know, these piano things for uh, new age or, or chill out music, but which is easy to make, easier to make, and probably where the artist doesn't mean too much. But the thing is that some of these channels, these Spotify channels, have hundreds of thousands of listeners, which you can understand what. Uh, Economically speaking, what this means for Spotify, like not having to pay anyone. So second related new, September tw uh, 2017, that's less than one year ago, the world guru of computational music is hired by Spotify for leading the, the AI lab. So you would, uh, if you mix the two things, you say, okay, well, that's what they're going to do. So now we are going all to consume robot-made music. In fact, uh, Francois Paché, said very quickly, no, 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 that's not what I want to do. I'm always considered, I, I cannot work without putting the human in the loop. And that's also my approach. I would never put the human out of the loop. Um, in fact, I like also this, this quote from Douglas Engelbart, who was one of the fathers of, of computer science, I mean, the inventor of the mouse, among so many other things. Uh, he, he talked in already in the early 60s about augmenting human intellect by means of computing. Uh, he was saying, by augmenting human intellects, we mean increasing the capability of a man to approach a complex problem situation, to gain comprehension, to suit his particular needs, etc. So I'm really, sim I sympathize with this approach, and uh, I don't see, so I, I also see, uh, I'm interested, in, rather than in replacing human capabilities, in using computers for augmenting them, and that also applies to creation and creativity. 
Um, so now let me do a, a, a personal introduction that starts with a quite long, long ago flashback that will explain a bit why, I mean, why I'm here at what, what I'm doing. So that's 37 years ago, I was playing a saxophone. I'm the one in the middle of the tenor saxophone. I was a very bad saxophone player because I didn't like to practice. I didn't like to rehearse. I was playing free jazz and I really didn't like to go scales up and down and all these type of things. So I was never making any real progress. Okay. In parallel, I was studying physics, which I have to say, uh, to be honest, I didn't enjoy that so, so much as, as expected. Until in the third year, I discovered computers. And I discovered computer programming. Now, when I listen our students from first year saying, oh, how fast you're teaching us. I remember this day in, third, in my third year, it was a two hour computer programming crash course. Say, that's an if, that's a while, next week, the Fourier transform. And it was a revelation. It was an epiphany because that day I understood also at physics, no one had told us about sound or music in the 80s, that those topics didn't exist. This day I understood that computers could be made for music. Uh, I mean, all I have told now before, obviously I didn't know it by this time. Okay? I didn't know anything about the history of, of computational creativity. Uh, but I understood, okay, they can do it. And what I knew already is that computers are great for doing repetitive and boring stuff. So I say, if I can tell them how to do what I don't like, I will be able to do what I like. So this day I decided I would become a computer music improviser. And so I finished, uh, I graduated, and since I didn't have the, the opportunities to go study a master abroad, I start studying computer music at home. And I kind of became like an independent amateur scientist or researcher. This is my first paper ever, published in 91 in Montreal in the International Computer Music Conference, which describes a system, a real-time improviser, which can improvise with one or two human players. The thing is that in this conference in Montreal, I met Xavier Serra, uh, which is a meeting that has been immortalized some months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so here in a comic book. Okay, so we met and uh, some months later, uh, I was working with Xavier on the catacombs of the uh, Miro Foundation where the Phonos uh, lab was. But uh, since there was not much money anyway, uh, I had to do other things. So then I became really, a, 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 as, as Xavier has said, a freelance media artist programmer. And I did many weird, very weird things, especially with Marceli Antunes. We first made a human-sized pig skin robot that reacted to the people talking at, at, at him. Uh, well, he didn't understand a word, obviously, but he could kind of gesticulate about what people were doing. We did a, an interactive installation in which the, the audience almost tortured the body of uh, Marcelli, which was held with an exoskeleton through a kind of uh, game-like interface. We did a one-man show based on Homer's Odyssey, uh, in which there were robots, uh, I mean, music robots performing. Uh, it was a very complicated uh, show, as you might guess, with this uh, scheme. Uh, I made some, uh, one of the first online composition systems uh, that was in, uh, starting in 98 for La Fura del Baus that was used for uh, the collaborative composition of uh, an opera, of the electronic parts on our opera by La Fura. And with, I will conclude with this forgettable picture of me as a computer music improviser, and I will start with the most, more, a bit more serious stuff. So as Xavier has said, in 99, or maybe it was 98, I don't remember very well, uh, somehow something that would become the DETIC started and the NTG was part of it. So that's really where my uh, re academic career restarts. Uh, so now I will briefly talk about three, the three generations. Uh, as I said, the first one, I will not talk much about the first one because uh, for several reasons. The React Table is, is a quite popular project. You might have heard already of it. I have talked like thousands of times about it. 
uh, and also it's more an interaction design, an engineering project that, that really strictly research. So I will skip it almost, that's the team that made it. And also, because for the last months you have been tortured with this uh, sound in the minus two floor for which I'm not responsible at all. And if you want, we can turn it uh, we can turn down the sound. I will not play today any video. Uh, I will just say, I mean, I find that this sound rather pleasing, but I understand that it's not something that to be to hear like for hours, all days, every day, every week, every month. So we can turn it down. I will not feel offended at all. Um, two things just about the React table. One was that, as I said, it was kind of more interaction design driven, but we were driven for a from a concept and not from a specific technology. So when we had to improve or create our own technologies, we were not at all scared of doing it. One example is Reactivision. Also, we were not computer vision experts at all. I mean, nothing. Uh, but this time, the, the computer, the, the optical tracking systems we, we, were, we checked in the early 2000s that were made specifically for IR didn't really meet our requirements. So we developed a new system, which is called Reactivision, which became, in fact, one of the de facto standards. It has been used for 10 years. It's open source um, for optical tabletop interaction. The second point I want to mention is that since 2009, uh, Reactable, the, uh, the spin-off company was created, and we have been giving uh, jobs to five to 10 people for nine years, something of which I'm really proud. So I go to the second uh, generation. The second generation is about uh, tangible and physiological interaction, and this is the people that uh, were involved in it. And the outcomes uh, were fourth PhD thesis, one European project and a couple of research grants from the Ministerio and also from Microsoft Research Cambridge. These are the titles of, of the, the theses that were defended. The focus was more on tabletop interaction from different perspectives, uh, some from more from the human side, others were more technical. And also we, we enter physiological interaction using brain-computer interfaces, which was the, the PhD of Sebastian Meaya. Uh, among that, we did a, a research project. Uh, we led a project which has ended two months ago, just, which is called Rapid Mix, which has focused on providing high level and easy to use uh, gestural control, mostly using machine learning techniques for the creative industries. So we go to the third and last generation, which I have called music creation modeling, and that's what I'm going to talk about today in the, the second part of the talk. <clears throat> this generation, uh, has been, was integrated by the three PhDs, Angel, Korak, and Daniel, and the researcher and collaborator, uh, Perfecto Herrera. And our focus uh, was in combining music information research with computational creativity. Three theses have been defended very recently in the last months, and one FP7 project uh, was led and achieved in, in 2016. These are the titles of the three theses. One deals more with synthesis of, of drum patterns. The other deals more with harmony in electronic music. And the third one is the one I'm going to cover a little bit today. The, uh, to put something a bit in context, this research, Giant Steps was a project uh, in which we led, which, uh, which integrated also some companies, some uh, music uh, industry companies, and it was about f uh, bringing knowledge-based tools to contemporary music production, in particular to electronic dance music. And uh, I have to say that when this project started in, in 2013, there was nothing in the industrial world about these type of topics. They still were either, as I say, very arty or uh, very academic. So uh, what is electronic dance music or EDM? Uh, I will not enter into detail, but obviously it's music based on electronic media. Uh, it's music made to dance, uh, to dance at, at clubs or at raves. And it's a, it's a music that has a strong emphasis on rhythm and, and timbre, and that also uh, contains very, well, many subgenres that are in fact quite different among all of them. I think it's, it at least it's good to put things in a, a little bit of context. So with this information, I'm gonna uh, head to the last part of the talk, 
where I'm going to talk about the similarity and style in EDM drum rhythms. So, uh, to put things in context, how are, well, drum patterns are the most important aspect of EDM music. They are made typically uh, with a visual uh, interface that's called the, the, the piano roll metaphor, uh, which, which we can see in this image. That's a bar of music. Okay? Uh, this bar is divided into four beats, which are the wider vertical lines, and each beat is divided into four sixteenth uh, notes, which are the grayer, the smaller lines. So that means in one bar, you have a 16 uh, step grid, and the horizontal lines cor correspond to the different instruments. Like here we have, uh, I cannot see very well, a kick drum, a snare. So I will show a, a very basic video uh, for those, for those that don't know. So that sounds a little bit, I don't know, boring, bit shit, sounds like slaves. So obviously you're gonna wanna spice it up a little bit, but the best way of doing that while keeping that same beat is just to add a cymbal. So we could add a hi-hat. There's a few different things that you can do with the hi-hat. You could either do it so that you've got the hi-hat on one, two, three, four, like you're doing the kick, snare, kick, snare. You've also got the hi-hat on every single one of those, or you could do it so that you've got the hi-hat doing the one and. So you've got one and two and three and four and. It's up to you, it all depends on what song you're doing. I'll show you both so you kind of get what it sounds like. Let's see. Cool, sounding better, it sounds like an actual drum beat now. Okay, that's a, a, a video, a, a YouTube tutorial I just found uh, yesterday. Uh, what did, uh, something also, some, detail I would like to, to specify for those of you that don't know about uh, clearly about this topic. What we saw is kind of symbolic creation of drum patterns, meaning uh, it's like writing a score and the files that result are very small and are, and are completely, I mean, are uh, without ambiguities because what they contain is the, the exact events and when these events happen. The other approach would be to use audio uh, and in fact, EDM producers tend to combine both. Today, I will only talk about the symbolic approach uh, because that's, this work has been done in this domain. You can imagine using symbolic is much easier to analyze the information. Otherwise, I mean, it's not obvious from, uh, it's like a speech to text, that would be the second, I mean, the, the part below would be, it's not obvious to extract clear information from the audio. Here, the information is clear and without any ambiguity. So all uh, the talk would be based on the symbolic domain. Uh, here, I mean, as we can deduce from this uh, Google search, it, the truth is that uh, the drum patterns are the most important part and are also kind of the more difficult part, especially for amateur producers. They don't know where to start. Even if the interface is very simple, the interface doesn't tell you so much about how things will, will sound, unless you have a very clear, Time. Uh, I mean, for many people, putting things on a grid doesn't tell too many things. So for most uh, amateur producers, the problem is like trial and, trial and error, or looking tutorials, copying patterns, stealing patterns, which leads to really kind of lack of creativity. Is there, would there be a solution to improve these problems? And that's what we try to do in this project. Uh, and in order to to better, I mean, to continue, we will give a bit of more information about the specificities or of EDM drum patterns. Uh, in this type of music, the drum patterns tend to be very short, like one bar, and they keep repeating, okay? They keep repeating with small variations, but subtle variations. The, the resolution is 16 uh, steps. Uh, for some styles, like drum and bass or jungle, maybe 13 steps is used, but for most of the styles, it means dividing a bar in 16 uh, parts is more than, than enough. This type of music is very stylistically driven, meaning that a house pattern is very different from a techno pattern. And, and it's kind of, very, everyone is very uh, uh, allied with, with their own style. Say, okay, that's not, for you maybe it seems all, all the same, but they are very different, okay? Um, then, as I said, in 2013, there weren't too many things uh, applied to this domain. So we started uh, with asking people. And we went to ask p 
people are really experts. We went to the Red Bull Music Academy because Red Bull was on one of the partners of the consortium. And, and what is Red Bull Music Academy? It's like it's a, it's a, an academy that gathers yearly uh, at, in different world capitals some, uh, a bunch, like 50 or the more promising, young and unknown music producers, and they teach them courses, master classes, conferences, they have access to the studio. So there, I mean, you, you have like the creme, uh, de la creme of the, the future uh, DJs and producers. So we did a, a, a survey about the intelligent drum machines of, of their dream in the near future. And these are some of the topics that appeared. Uh, we did 25 questions using a 1 to 5 Likert scale. We also gave them the chance to put open words. We, we also carried interviews, uh, which uh, this is also takes into account. So these are some of the words that appear, variation, syncopation, randomness. These are some of the questions related specifically to style and variation, which is the topic I'm going to, to keep talking about. And this is a summary of the top three favorite kind of features, what I would really like to find. I would like to teach this system my own style. We are talking about intelligent drum machines. That's what we told them. How do you imagine them? What would you like to do? So with 4.4 uh, over 5, I would like to teach them my own style. I would like to create variations of my own patterns was 4.35 out of 5. And I would like to navigate between patterns 4.35 uh, uh, over five. So we know a bit what people were expecting or would like to have. We will talk about these three things, style, variation, and continuous navigation. So let's start with style. Uh, if we, uh, to talk about music style, if we go as back as, as the 50s, Leonard Mayer, who was a composer and philosopher, already stated that uh, he proposes a model of, a statistical model inspired by Shannon's communication theory. Okay? Uh, and since then, probabilities, and in particular Markov chains, have been widely used for stylistic algorithmic composition. What is a Markov chain? Uh, it could be defined as a stochastic model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event, look at this image, depends on the state attained in the previous step. So the probability of E to go again to E is a 0, 3, and the probability of E to go to A is a 0, 7. Um, this is what would be called a, one, a first order Markov chain because only the previous step uh, is relevant. So the memory is, has only one step. Uh, higher, ste higher orders have been used. And for example, I will put a very basic music example uh, using a second order Markov chain done by an undergrad student in the uh, Processament Audio Ten Real course. Uh, here also I will play you, you will hear two, two experts, one after the other. Um, here the music will not be as convincing as before because only pitch was considered, meaning you will listen something regular, like one note after the other, without any rhythmic variation, but you will, see no, you will hear notes that probably will make you think about where these notes came from. So in this example, this system uh, could be fed in real time. I mean, it was done by a student uh, in, in a course, uh, as a lab. Uh, so it opens a MIDI file, which is symbolic music. It analyzes, it creates, it creates the transition uh, matrices, and with that, it keeps generating things. So let's listen for a moment. And as I say, there, there are two parts. <laughs> time we would make a quiz. But I guess that probably many of you, even uh, with this obstinato thing, have found things about Bach's area of Goldberg variation, uh, Goldberg variations, and probably something of Satie, which in fact is a Nocien. It's hard to listen Satie on obstinato, but I, I think you, you kind of got that some of the uh, 
phrases are really kept. So this is a second order uh, Markov chain. So what do we do with drums and style? So we decided, OK, I mean, let's start using probabilities and let's start uh, using uh, Markov chains. So let's ap approach it the same way. Uh, a style will be given, but a collection of MIDI files, which, are, as I say, are symbolic representations of the music, uh, uh, by a collection of drum patterns, uh, which will be analyzed, and then their probabilities will be stored in arrays. We will see how. Um, as I say, this gives a very open definition of what style is, because anyone is able to decide that's style. Or if I put my mu music, it will be it will learn my, my style. Uh, but before talking or, or for understanding what type of probabilities we, we better deal now, uh, we need to understand that there are really differences between making melodies and making a, a drum beat. Uh, the first obvious is that instead of notes, we use instruments like kick drum, snare, but that's not very relevant. The second is how we deal with time. Because if in melodic composition, we can think somehow as time as being a relative thing that keeps flowing. Whereas in drum pattern uh, generation, each step has a different role. Like, uh, for example, in many basic uh, rock patterns, as we saw in the video, the kick drum uh, is, occupies step one and nine and the snare drum would be in step 5 and 13. So you cannot treat all steps independently. So the first approach, simple one, would be, OK, first let's consider probabilities, make them step dependent. OK, so as I said, we have 16 steps. So we have already some indicator that will give us probabilities for each of the steps. The second thing is, OK, what we do with what's sounding in each step? The first uh, approach, the simpler one, would be make them independent. Like, OK, there are probability for a kick drum and the probability for a snare, and they are all independent. That's not very realistic from a musical perspective. So we decided to make them dependent. And the simplest thing was to treat all the combinations of possible instruments. Like, if you have eight voices, you have two to the eighth uh, combinations. You have 256 combinations from zero, from all zeros, meaning silence, to all ones, meaning all instruments sounding at the same time. Uh, obviously, all instruments sounding at the same time is very unlikely to occur, but this will be considered in the probabilities. So if we, then we have the order. If, if, so considering that, if you have order zero, meaning there's no memory. Every step depends only on the probabilities of its own. Uh, we would have a, a matrix 16 by 256, given these values. However, if we put order 1, we would have 16, 256, 256, and, and so on. So we, we tried different things. Okay, uh, I'm explaining it obviously very quickly, but there were many, many trials uh, for arriving to this conclusion. So the thing that works better was second order. And this means that we have, for each step, a 3D uh, transition array. Or globally, we have a 4D transition array, uh, in which by 16, 256, 256, 256, 256. Uh, obviously, for other numbers, uh, it, it changes. So if you apply a random seed, and a random seed here is a vector, a 16-step, 16 16-dimensional 16 vector from, with values 0 to 1. Uh, you get a pattern, and this pattern will be compliant with the style that you, that you defined. And not only can you do that, but since we are dealing with, probabil with probabilities and with, with arrays, it's also somehow easy to cross-fade between uh, styles. Like you have one style the other, and you can go from one to the other just by interpolating these arrays. Um, so Obviously, when you do this type of research, you have to make lots of tests. Uh, otherwise, how do you validate things? So I will here, I mean, I will talk just about informal validation at this point. So we listened to many things. And somehow, good results were achieved. But there were some 
little problems. And they were given by the fact that our model was musically quite agnostic, musically speaking. It was agnostic, for example, to syncopation, which is, it means that treat, well, I will explain a little better. And it was also hard to control. Um, well, when, so several things that appear on a pattern uh, tend, if they are very relevant to the pattern, they tend to be preserved. So you would not want to modify something and eliminate what really makes this identity. This is related to syncopation. The other is, if you want to make variations, you really want to control the amount of variation that you want to apply. You don't want ma to, to make very sudden changes. So first, we started by studying syncopation. And what is syncopation? Syncopation in, in music is related to the idea that if we are exposed to something that's periodic and regular, we then expect things to have happen at these points. So when things happen somewhere else, like uh, uh, there's an accent where it shouldn't be, or there's an accent is missing where it should be, we have kind of this sensation of syncopation, which is great for moving our body and which is, is essential in many musics uh, from jazz, flamenco, salsa, and many musics all over the world, especially the ones that are meant to, to make people dance. And so obviously this is also uh, applies to electronic dance music. So how do you study syncopation? The good news is that also syncopation is not just black and white. Uh, it, it can be quantified. Why? Because uh, they are hierarchies, in, in, typically, in a bar. This is a bar. Uh, and as you see, uh, the more important uh, event or, or, or in a bar is the first one, whereas uh, the second more important is, would be the third beat then the second and the fourth. And we go like in a fractal-like zoom in, uh, giving different weights to different parts. So depending on where the syncopation occurs, it will have more weight or less weight. The first, the, the image on the top is an experiment, it's a theoretical uh, template from 85, whereas the, the one below is an um, experimental template uh, made by uh, listening tests. See, they are not identical, but somehow they concede. The idea is that using these profiles, you can, as I say, quantize the importance, either be on the syncopation side, like going against, or the importance in going in favor of the, the pattern. So the idea is every event can be quantified, and we can decide which ones not to modify in order to keep the identity of the patterns that we want to create. So <clears throat> that's, it. I mean, in order to, mm, <clears throat> sorry. So that's more or less what we had until now, until I've told. You can create a style by analyzing collections of files. You can crossfade between these styles. You can apply uh, discrete variations, like here on the variation thing. It's like pressing a button, you get a new pattern. That's adding a new, bringing a new seat. You can also, Ha, uh, have continuous controls, which I haven't explained. I mean, I, I'm just synthesizing some aspects, like making uh, dealing with the co a com commonness, which was a, a continuous control. Or you can change the uh, density of the different uh, files. Uh, now, all that being kind of syncopation aware, so knowing what can be done and not. Uh, as I said, in order to validate these things, you need really to make many tests. That's not trivial, but you have to do it. So uh, I, we, we did many tests. I will just talk about one. We asked two uh, professional producers named Sano and Bosca to provide 10 patterns each on their own style. Uh, then we got uh, many listeners, the, um, the subjects to, to experiment with, and we gave them to listen to some of the patterns, of the original patterns of, uh, of these producers. So they, they could kind of learn or identify the style. Then we generated new patterns following these styles, and we asked, uh, and to each listener, we gave some original ones, some uh, generated ones, and also 
other ones, some from the other um, producer. And they had to rate how similar or how belonging to the original style they, they were going from one to five. What we can, you can see here, it's a surprising thing, is that the, uh, well, the, the ones that it says Dr. Drums, these are the generated ones, that we passed the Turing test and we did a little better than the originals. So people thought that the generated belonged more to the style than the original ones, not by much, by 325 against 33, the blue, is Sano, one of the producers, and for Bosca, who maybe has a more identifiable style, it was 3-4 out 3-5. Uh, so that's really good, I mean, great, better, I mean, that's passing a Turing test, I would say. Um, also, we ask the producers, and they all recognize without errors which patterns belonged to their style and which belongs to the other guy. So that's fine. I will make. Uh, I will show a, a video of the prototype at this stage. I will jump uh, a little bit in the video to show the, the density control. Let's see. I will show another video uh, about with showing this density stuff in a, uh, this syncopation aware density in a, which has been recently ported to a commercial product, uh, which is a, mob, a drum machine for iOS. So here, the system learns while the, the musician is, is performing. Below, we, uh, the user is changing the density. Okay. So somehow we, the, the hypothesis of style had been validated. The issue with syncopation had been solved, but the system was not yet perfect. Uh, and we had kind of still problems with how to control or to measure this amount of variation, which led us to a quite ambitious and really uh, complicated project, which is studying the perception of similarity in drum patterns. And that's a, a really unexplored th territory. Uh, most of the things that have been done uh, uh, in this domain, they deal with very uh, basic and, and syntactic models, like using the eddic distance, which is used in computational linguistics for measuring how dissimilar two uh, strings are. But that obviously is not very perceptual, at least when it applies to rhythm. Uh, the experiments have been done with very simple rhythms, with very simple sounds, like only silence or beep, beep, Beep. And they have been done without any uh, beat-induced context, meaning there was no, uh, what does that mean is that, for example, two patterns that are shifted, uh, if you keep listening uh, continuously, if you are not, if the beat is not induced, they sound the same. But if, of course, if they are put in a context, they sound completely different. So really, as I say, uh, there was, I mean, the problem was, not co was quite complicated. We wanted to study similarity in a, a bit, uh, in a pulse <clears throat> conscious situation and dealing with polyphony, meaning with real d patterns, like there are different sounds. So the problem, as I say, was complicated. And 
So the question is, is it possible to do so? Uh, and I will be very brief, and I'm already reaching the end of this presentation. Uh, so what we did is, uh, no, yeah. Sorry. How are we going to find a metric uh, that can predict uh, this similarity between complex rhythm patterns? So we start, obviously, by making listening tests. Uh, I will, as I say, only document one of them. So we selected nine rhythms, which belong to three styles, like techno, house, and, and break, and we created different pairs, random pairs of them, and we made people uh, listen to one after the other uh, with, in a beat-induced situation. That's the, the, the figure below. So you, the beat is kept, and you listen to something and something else, and you say how similar or how dissimilar they are. Okay? We had also some control pairs, which are the purple ones on the bottom of, of the matrix so that we were listening, if, I mean, checking if people were really listening or they were just leaping and pressing buttons. So uh, what was the result? I mean, after we had this, this similarity matrix, we applied multidimensional scaling and we got a 2D space with the patterns. The first good news was that the patterns that the patterns we had put, they were quite uh, well distributed, I mean, or quite well separated. So that said, well, that's a that's good start. Okay, uh, it, I mean, that's not a random distribution. Uh, so I guess the second question is, is it possible to find some relevant, relevant descriptors for these spaces? And we, we kept trying. And so what we, we do, we kind of read all the literature uh, from different aspects, from uh, perception, and we decided to simplify the, the rhythms that maybe had eight voices into three bands, low, mid, and high. Uh, and for each of these bands, we co computed several descriptors that we also picked from different places, like um, syncopation, complexity, density. So with all these descriptors, then we applied a multitask lasso and uh, regression and see what happens. And the fact is that we find quite, uh, I mean, with, uh, the results were not that bad. Uh, there's room for improvement, but uh, somehow the space can be quite well um, predicted, as I will show now in a video. So what are the possibilities of rhythmic spaces? I mean, you, you understand the problem? Now uh, you can create a space of rhythm where each point is a, a rhythm pattern. Uh, one obvious application would be uh, for browsing drums. Uh, because EDM producers, in their hard drives, they have thousands of units of those. They have thousands of patterns. And how they look for them in an alphabetic list, which obviously is impossible. So uh, placing them by uh, similarity in a 2D space would be really a, a, a great advantage. The second is even more interesting, which is generating. And how we did that, uh, I mean, using a denoloid uh, triangulation, you, and you can pick any point in the space that doesn't have a rhythm, a pattern, and create one based on the, their neighbors. So now you will see a video uh, in which you will hear, or you will see a ma the mouse moving around, navigating in a 2D plane, uh, and you will see nine points, but you will permanently listening to, to a drum pattern that keeps changing in real time. Because it's being generated in real time. Here you have the representation. So 
uh, this is the end. I mean, what I've shown is that we, in fact, we did uh, deal with the three, uh, we did other things too, but uh, today I've just selected a few, uh, with the idea of cre style creation, like personal style creation, with the idea of variations, uh, with the idea of navigating between patterns. Uh, what we are doing today in this domain, we are further exploring this rhythmic space and, and similarity stuff, which is really in, uh, infinite. We are also opening other lines, like we are working with audio uh, instead of symbolic. That's obviously more complicated. You need to extract the information first. We are working with drums and bass, uh, which in electronic music is, I mean, it's very important to know the relation between both. And of course, as it wouldn't be other, couldn't be otherwise, we are starting to apply deep learning techniques uh, we cannot escape from, from the trend. Uh, but in general, from a general perspective, I would say that we continue modeling uh, music knowledge for supporting human music creativity. These are the related publications with this part of the topic, the final part, and, and this is what I've shown today. So thank you very much. I guess there is time uh, for a few questions. Any question? Yes? Yeah? No? Well, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> At least along these lines. Okay. Uh, I know, sorry, not that. This one. So along the line that I, I have explained, uh, this is what we are doing now. About new directions, I don't know, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Very interesting talk, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is it maybe possible to generate out of language, like from German, from Spanish, rhythm put with, your, with your approach? To study the rhythm, the different to rhythms extract, of languages. Let's say extract um, from, a, from a word or a sentence the rhythm that would make. Well, I would say for that you don't need that approach, but uh, of I mean, of course, you can with to analysis it tools. I mean, it would be very simple, at least the first, I mean, the first results. Like you have uh, speech and finding uh, the attacks. So what tendency, what rhythmic tendencies it has? Yeah. Uh, then let's say continuing in this direction. I mean, and I don't know if from that it will already be easy to guess some differences between the rhythmic patterns in different languages. But honestly, I have not, I don't know anything about that. Just a, thank you. Um, so uh, my question would be, um, so for DJ, would uh, th those kind of tools would allow him to uh, make music sort of re real time while he's at a concert? Or is this something that that's, yeah. I don't know, you have to like record it previously? No, I mean, the, the two possibilities are there. You can do it on your studio and then double check the results. You can do it lifetime, I mean, in, in live. Uh, for the second, I have to say, I mean, when we made React Table, uh, we were, I mean, we have, I have, I mean, as a free jazz improviser, I'm keen of real time. I would say most DJs aren't keen of risk, of taking risks. So that I've learned during this last decade. So DJs prefer to have things really under control. Uh, we asked DJs about this thing. I mean, we made interviews. They wouldn't tend to use it as a real thing, or at least they would do it in a very controlled situation. But that's because they don't want to take risks. Not all of them. <laughs> and I'm not judging it. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Maybe I have a, I have a 
question. Uh, yeah, I have a question because I have I I. I am always asked for that question and, and, and never know what to answer. Uh, clearly, because of Magenta and the, the latest trends, uh, there is a, when people come to, to, to apply for the master's or the PhD, a significant number, they, and you, when you ask them what they want to do, and they want to develop algorithms for uh, automatic composition, algorithmic composition, so that they can uh, uh, create a company that uh, can make a lot of money and, and, and replace all the composers. And, um, and well, lately, I, 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 I typically I send them to you to answer that question. But if, and then, so when I send them to you, what do you tell them? <laughs> so, Okay, so there's one person here that uh, emailed yesterday, I want to work on algorithmic composition. Sorry that I'm using you. And I told him, oh, great, tomorrow I have this talk. So you, uh, after you <laughs> listen to that, you'll see. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's really, I don't know what to say. On one side, as I have said, this goes back from 50 years. Uh, and for 50 years, it hasn't been like very trendy. Mm. Today, it happens to be trendy, and as I showed from the, the Spotify thing, and I'm not sure that this trendiness is always uh, mm, well, I mean, I don't like the reasons for that. So I mean, if the thing is now we are going to listen to uh, computer to music made my computers in Spotify without knowing it and without so without giving credit to anyone I think that's terrible uh, so that answers one side the, the other what do you want to do what I can say is uh, running a, a music tech company is very very difficult and I would not advise that to anyone <laughs> That's uh, another part of the answer.